Bureau is called Winter Bureau, and she works with small businesses, cultural organizations, academia, and lots of food and beverage companies. Uh, she also does a lot of personal work, which she's going to show some today. Um, her personal work and side projects often focus on her multicultural background, documentation, and collage. Um, she and I also work together occasionally. We just launched a new workshop series called Sunday Sauce Brands for focusing on specifically small businesses who might need a little bit of branding help. Um, you can talk to her about Gloria Estefan. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, her podcast blog called Podcast Thing and Wine. Everybody give it up for Veronica. Hi, everybody. Um, I really look forward to your Gloria Stefan questions. <laughs> But um, thank you so much to um, Margot and to Stuart for asking me to come speak here today, um, and to Jeff for putting on this amazing conference, and for all of you guys showing up. And I don't know if you knew what you were in for, because so Kumar kicked it off with a little math and science, and I'm going to kick it into some history. So you guys are in for an um, old school you know, class lesson. So as Margot mentioned, uh, I run a design studio in Chicago called the Winter Bureau. Let's see. Yep, there it is. Um, that's my Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me out. Um, and I work with a variety of clients, cultural institutions, uh, a lot of wine clients, do packaging and um, branding and identity for small businesses and other creatives. But I really didn't want to talk to you guys about my clients today. If you, if you want to check that out, go check out my website. I wanted to talk to you about something that's been really important in my work as both an artist and as a designer, which is history, uh, specifically cultural history. So I figured if I was going to be talking to you guys about history, it was only fair that I start with a little bit of my own. So um, I grew up in this town called West New York. New Jersey, uh, and it's just four miles outside of Manhattan, um, and it's where actually a lot of Cuban exiles moved, aside from Miami, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and you know, both of my parents are Cuban exiles. I was born in the States, uh, but I grew up in a pretty Cuban household. You see, uh, it's totally not lit. Relax, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, and like, oh, sorry. like most first generation kids, um, I grew up hearing a lot of stories about my parents' and grandparents' lives in Cuba. And you might think that that's where my interest in history sort of started, but it didn't. Because, like Kumar said, like, I just found it really boring and I had no idea what it had to do with me. Um, so I didn't really care at the time. What really, really piqued my interest in history was growing up a kid of the 80s, right, and being obsessed with movies like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> um, and, of course, an all-time favorite, The Goonies. Thank you. All right, good. I was worried this crowd might be a little young for that. Um, um, and... What I loved about these movies really had less to do with adventure and more to do with this idea of like mystery and discovery. And so I was convinced that when I grew up, I wanted to be an archeologist, even though I had no idea what the hell that meant. Um, and, but what I really liked was, what I was attracted to was this idea of getting to like hold this ancient artifact that hadn't been touched for centuries by anybody. This idea, like, to me it was kind of like time travel. Like I was always a geeky kid who we'd go see a like, historical site um, for a field trip and like loved this idea of like, oh my god, I'm touching this wheel. <laughs> that, this wheel that was, you know, built in 1782 and just like, wow, I'm touching this and I, it's almost like 
traveling through time, right? It kind of collapses the space between like my life and their life, and in that moment, it all sort of comes together. So I love this idea of, you know, digging and exploring, or even digging through like an attic to find, you know, some sort of map that led to a hidden treasure. <laughs> Um, but I, I didn't really have a lot of access to ancient sites growing up in West New York. Um, or even an attic filled with generations worth of stuff for that matter. Uh, so I did my digging where I did most of my hanging out as a kid, which was my grandparents' house. Um, my grandfather, Neche, used to pick me up from school every single day. That's me and him. Um, he was an accountant. If you could notice the uh, <laughs> pocket protector, yeah. Um, so he would pick me up from school every day, and I'd hang out with him until my parents picked me up from um, from there, you know, after work. And usually, while he was like off doing something else, I'd sneak downstairs to his desk, and I'd rummage through. Um, he also liked to keep a lot of toys up there. Um, I'd, I'd rummage through his tax papers and ledger papers, and I used to really love um, filling out the tax forms, <laughs> which is not a pleasure that I've brought into my adult life. <laughs> but, um, and then I would like really, really quietly like try to open those, those three drawers right there. I'd try to open those and look for like these little clues to like possible mysteries that might have existed. Um, that I might be able to like piece together and solve. Or I'd look for some sort of like hidden treasure that like I thought for some reason my grandfather might be in possession of. But inevitably I'd get caught, right? And my grandfather would yell at me to get out of his things. Uh, you can imagine that, like, a really anal accountant did not like a child rummaging through all of his stuff. <laughs> um, so I never really had much luck. And obviously, I didn't become an archaeologist. But as I grew older, um, I became really interested in these boring stories from Cuba that I didn't really care about as a child. And in fact, in grad school, I began working with my grandparents to document these stories that I grew up hearing. This is my, uh, my grandmother, Estrella, and my grandfather, Nature. Um, and I knew, like, my grandfather was a bit of the family archivist, and I knew that if I didn't take the time to sort of document those stories, that a lot of them would be lost with him. And so, I started to record interviews with them, asking them all these questions, um, and I began looking through photos that he managed to save from Cuba because you weren't actually allowed to bring that stuff with you when you left the country, right? You had to leave most of your personal belongings behind. And so like a lot of Cuban families, my grandfather began to send uh, photographs and documents over to a family member in the States about a year before they knew that they were gonna leave the country. It's another great photo of my grandfather looking a little bit like Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother. Um, um, and sort, sadly, after I finished documenting these stories, my grandfather did pass away in 2009. But it wasn't until then that I really got a chance to go through all of the stuff that I had tried to like nose around in as a kid. And I discovered a lot of things. I discovered these fascinating and strange treasures that I had never seen or noticed before, uh, ranging from these like beautifully designed objects, um, like his you know, Japanese calculators that apparently he didn't need just one of, but three to back up. That one on the right is, was in its package, just in case. Um, and also, you know, his collection of staplers, which are, these are five of the nine that I found that I took home. I think at that point my grandmother was starting to worry if I didn't have enough money to buy my own stapler. Um, 
but um, to, to the really mundane stuff, right? To like his comb that he kept in that pocket protector you saw before. Um, McDonald's coffee stirrers, there was a couple of those. Um, and really, really, really old chapstick. Um, back when they used to make it in a tin and not plastic. Um, and then there were these political objects, right? This was his um, accountants in exile card that he got when he came to the United States. And then I also got a chance to reconnect with several toys from my youth, which apparently I found out my grandfather had this thing for, you know, keeping safe <laughs> or stealing. Um, <laughs> so all these weird random toys that either belong to me or, you know, my cousins or something. Um, I find, you know, in a cigar box hidden under shirts. Um, and I don't know if anybody remembers these in the crowd. Does anybody have a speak and spell? Come on, yes, yes. I thank my grandfather for taking that because it's in complete working condition. <laughs> um, but I noticed that like, all of these little things started to reveal a greater picture of my grandfather's life. And it wasn't just the things that he kept, it was even where he kept them. Like my mint condition Super Mario Brothers game that I discovered, <laughs> yeah, um, I should sell that on eBay, um, <laughs> that I discovered in the left hand drawer of his desk, like he needed to keep that around for easy access at any point, I don't know. Um, and his last rights card, uh, which is kind of like a, a Catholic in case of emergency card, right? Where um, it just tells if somebody finds you and you've either passed or about to, that they should perform last rites on you. And so he kept this in this prescription um, holder inside another holder, uh, a, a photo sleeve. And there's so much I love about this object. Um, like the fact that my grandfather still had this with him even though the address it gave for his church was in Havana, Cuba. Um, and the fact that he, you know, taped it up to, to fix it and the, these cuttings of, of the corners, which I found out was like a signature Nietzsche move. Um, I can only imagine that it's so that it fits better into his wallet. He could always cut the corners off things. Um, but it's these little notes that he left behind and like that, that calculation in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and I have no idea what those 41 years mean, but it's these little marks that I think reveal this human interaction and this existence of a person. Um, and so I gathered as, you know, as many objects that you know, I was interested in and brought them back to Chicago with me and you know had my grandmother send the rest and I lived with these objects for about two years um, some of these things I use daily I still use daily like his calculator and you know one of the staplers I don't use all five um, but other things like his ID cards uh, and photographs they sat in you know these archival boxes on my shelf and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with them, but I knew I wanted to do something with them. And while I was really invested in preserving these objects, I also really wanted to engage with them and to share their stories. So on April 15th, on tax day, 2011, my grandfather's favorite day, <laughs> um, I started a project called the Nature Collection. And I decided that I would document all of these objects collected by my grandfather and I'd photograph them and I would share my memories about them or whatever I knew about the objects in a daily blog until I ran out of objects, which I did not count beforehand. Um, so this is, what, this is what the site looks like now. It had a little bit of a different design beforehand, but, um, and I really didn't know what to expect. I figured, 
uh, at least a few designers would be really interested in sort of the, um, you know, vintage office supplies for sure and some of the, you know, the old packaging. But I didn't think that anybody would be interested in this like paper turkey that my grandfather took from one of our Thanksgivings. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, I, I didn't feel like that was enough. Uh, while I was really excited to start this like online archive of my grandfather's things, this is his um, typewriter, which was the first object that he bought when he um, got his first paycheck in the States. And he still used that about, till about two weeks before his, he died um, because he held out for one more tax season. Um, but, you know, I love this idea of archiving, but I really wanted to engage with these objects, too. I wanted to use them as a platform for making, because I found them really inspiring. And so I decided that in addition to this new daily blog practice that I had given myself, that I would take one or more of these objects from that week's post, and I would create an original screen print. So I would design and print a new print at the end of that week which was totally insane. Um, but it was really important for me to, you know, to um, create something new from these objects of the past. So I was really interested in engaging with this question of how do we engage with history in a way that moves beyond nostalgia? I didn't want it to just be a, a, a project where I just sort of replicated this aesthetic of this historical object, which I think as designers, you know, we see a lot. If you just you look up vintage on Pinterest, um, there's a lot of this like replication and one-to-one -one copying, which is great for other reasons, and I, you know, also am drawn to it. But I wanted to figure out a way to sort of move beyond that. So since I had set myself up for this, you know, automated project, I gave myself some constraints to keep myself somewhat sane. Um, I posted one object per day, Monday through Friday. So a week might look like this. This is my grandfather's, um, this was his accounting card that you know identified him as an accountant in Cuba. This is um, a Smurf toy that my mom gave me when I was six years old that I didn't discover till I was in my 30s <laughs> after my grandfather passed. Um, I had one of his calculators and this, you know, his tape recorder and this fax that he had sent over from Cuba to the States. And, you know, each print had to contain at least one or more of the objects from that, from that week. So it might look like this. From that week, I pulled two objects. I pulled this, you know, fax sent from Cuba to New York and um, this uh, tape recorder, which used an actual cassette, by the way. Um, and I just, you know, for me, a lot of my work, if you've seen it, it uses a lot of texture and um, I was really drawn to this texture on the, you know, upper right and left hand corner of the fax and sort of like, you know, digital noise. Um, and then all the prints, I made them all 11 by 14, which is really easy, you know, really easy size for me to pull and I was screen printing them all by hand. Um, I restricted them to two to three colors and um, a really small edition of 15. I kind of liked the idea of them being collectible, um, but also, you know, I didn't want to be screen printing like 100 prints each week. <laughs> uh, and so this was um, the print that came from week number two, and it's still one of my favorites and by far the most geeky because it uses the... Um, it uses a microphone from the tape recorder and uses a noise from this fax and the duplicate. And so it's like these two recording devices and it kind of makes my head want to explode and I love it. Um, <laughs> um, you can see here. So it, it, and I also borrowed the shape from the percentage sign. So I used that sort of rectangular shape a little bit from the Smurf and from the percentage sign on the calculator. This was his uh, protractor, which again, you know, I think is a beautiful object and I really love. But what I found myself really drawn to were these little things like that piece of tape that he used to fix this protractor and even that scribble on there. Um, 
Like, I love that. I love these little marks and these little interactions that reveal almost as evidence of human existence, right? More than just the protractor in itself. So this is the final print for that. And I felt the same way about these stamps. Um, he had a bunch of stamps that he had saved. And I think that they're really beautiful on their own, but you know, what I really love about the, these stamps is I love those little marks made by the post office that, you know, stamp the time as to when they were sent out. And what I really, really love about stamps are actually the backs. Because <laughs> I feel like, I mean, they're, they're kind of these gorgeous compositions um, on their own, but I feel like they reveal so much more than the front of them because they hold this whole other history in them. Um, but you know, the, like, the texture and the, the print of that paper that it was pulled from in that exact moment that that was taken and saved. Um, it holds so much more information. And so this is the, um, this is the final print where I used a little bit of that postage stamp. Um, can't really tell too much on screen, but I have some prints in the back. It's like a day glow orange and I just use a, that texture from the back of the stamps. This is another object, and he had lots of objects. I could, I could give four talks on just the objects he had, but I'm not going to show you them all today. Uh, this is his shoehorn and uh, my mini slinky. These objects are actually a lot smaller than you probably think they are. Um, and then also this like incredibly strange Spanish to English crib sheet that I found. And if you see, it's like, if you guys can read it, it says like open, close, over, under you know, whatever. And, um, and then it has some like, you know, accounting stuff, which you would expect, like these expenses, these are the expenses of the trip. And then it says, she always has to have her own way. <laughs> so I'm not really sure like what this was used for. <laughs> but um, I don't know, like, I don't know. <laughs> it was really interesting. And the final print, I used my slinky and uh, my grandfather's shoehorn and uh, just extracted, I did you know, like a lot of extracting of language in these things. This push-pull, again, is one of my favorite prints because it's a really nice mix of both of ours stuff. And what I really loved about these images was that they were both a reflection of the past and the present, right? They were like a mix of the old and the new, had these historical roots, but you know, fit into a completely modern aesthetic um, and so this other object, um, as my, one of my, my grandfather used boxes to store all sorts of things, whatever box he could find. Um, but this is a, a cigar box, which he kept a bunch of toys in. And again, you know, what I'm really drawn to in this, um, aside just from the cigar box, is like, you know, the coffee stain on this, the, the fact that my grandfather put his name on it, which he did with most of his things. <laughs> And um, I really love this, you know, these pieces of tape that are just like torn off. And again, it's just sort of this like stamping of time of like when that was pulled off and just like this moment that I'm really attracted to. And so this is the final print for that. But what was really cool about this project what, is that it didn't just become about my, uh, it just wasn't a project about my grandfather's things because what was great is that I kept getting people um, emailing me and talking to me saying like, oh, I have all these collections of my grandfather's things or my you know, family member's things or, um, and there was this connection to objects in this way. And you know, they either connected with sharing these stories of like a loved one who had passed or you know, just connecting to a toy that they were like, oh my God, I totally had that. Was that like in a Burger King value meal? Yes, I had that toy. Um, and it was really great, this connection that people have to objects. And it, it's kind of open because each person could have their own connection with that thing. And so, 
you know, I just began thinking about how do, you know, how do we preserve our cultural history in a way that allows us to develop or grow with it? And it's a little bit like what um, Nick was talking about in uh, Son and Zimmer's talk yesterday. It's like looking back as you're going forward and bringing that stuff with you, right? We get to pick and choose these pieces of history that we want to take with us, and we can bring it into the lives that we live now. Um, and it was great because it felt like I was able to engage with this material history of objects in a way that started to move into a contemporary space where the past and present both meet. And this is something I try to do in my work a lot. And at the end, the project ran 29 weeks with about 149 objects. And I learned a lot working uh, on this project. I learned a lot about my grandfather. I learned a lot about myself and the power of objects. And I also learned a really important rule was that not everybody can be Indiana Jones. <laughs> we should all know that. <laughs> and that's okay because I realized that I don't want to just preserve and study history. I want to play with it. Right? I want to use history as a platform for making and as a point to jump from. And I hope that if you take anything from this talk, you know, it encourages you to dig up your own history or even just encourages you to look around and notice it in all of these little traces of history that are you know, all around us in our daily lives. And you know, at the end of the day, history is just the stories of the past that we want to remember. And it's really, it's ultimately these connections to that past that make us care. So go out and make some good ones. Thanks. That was so lovely. Thank you so much. Um, my first question is, is, I'm wondering if you can tell us maybe just a little bit briefly on like, you know, I don't know, just in case anyone doesn't know about like the political history between America and Cuba and like what it actually means to leave a country in exile and maybe some of the pressures that uh, Cuban people were experiencing that were making them leave the country. Sure, yeah. Um, so probably most of you know, so Castro came into the country in 1959 um, and some people were pretty happy about that coup. A lot of people weren't. Uh, my grandparents happened to be the ones that weren't. They were, you know, probably in their 30s or, you know, late 20s when that happened. Just started to get a house, all that stuff. My grandfather had finished his higher degree. Um, and all of that stuff was kind of taken away. You all of a sudden had to work, you know, everybody worked for the government. Everybody, if, it didn't matter if you had a professional um, degree you know, everybody was on the same playing field. Um, and so my grandparents kind of tried to leave right away. Um, and to be honest, I think the most Cubans didn't really think it would last that long. Um, and my grandfather got a visa to leave the country in 1960, but it didn't allow for bringing the rest of the country, the rest of the family with them. So he didn't, he wouldn't want to like leave them behind. So they didn't leave until, you know, 1970. But if you were going to leave the country, there was a short period of time where you were allowed to do so. Um, and if you did, you know, you were sort of considered this traitor. And um, you had to do a certain amount of, like, work in the sugarcane fields before you were allowed to, you know, be given that permission. Uh, but you couldn't bring your stuff with you. So, you know, all of your things kind of stayed behind. You can bring, like, one suitcase. You know, my grandmother was able to keep her, um, the setting of her wedding ring, but they popped the diamond off, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, there was a lot of things that were left behind. So people left behind families and stuff and, you know, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stuart has a question. Hey, thank you for that. Um, the objects that your grandfather um, collected obviously tell like a really like visually rich 
story and reveal a lot about his personality. Yeah. Um, how do you think that that changes for this generation now that we live so much of our life like in a digital environment? God, I don't know. I am a sucker for the old analog stuff. And again, I think it, it goes back to this fact that I, I really like this little, I like, I like the textures that human leave, like humans leave on things like this, you know, tearing out of books or the weathering of a page. Um, it's those really, it's those little moments that I really love. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, a lot of those objects were tech objects, right? I mean, the calculator, the, the typewriter, those were tech objects in their day. And, uh, you know, people really hype them up the way that we hype up a, an iPad. And, and I think one of the great things that I've noticed the more I work with history is just like, it's all the same. It's all the same. Like we keep thinking about like, technology is changing everything and everything's so different right now, but it really isn't. It's like, it's this, we've been having the same conversation for centuries. There isn't anything that's original and that's fine. It's really comforting to me. I feel like we can build from that and, and create work that is, you know, a little bit deeper and more rooted than that. Awesome. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. My um, father-in-law is actually an immigrant from Hungary. He left the, he, had, he was basically forced to leave Hungary yeah. because of the revolution and did it in such a way that um, he had to steal a train conductor's outfit and make himself a train conductor to travel uh, west or whatever. But That's some Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and once I learned this about him, uh, I try all the time to get details of the story out because to me that's like something well beyond like anything I've ever had to deal with. So yeah. I was wondering if your grandfather at all was willing or forthcoming in their uh, um, information to, to, you know what I mean? Like if it was like a, a place of hurt for them to have to leave their home. It was certainly like a, a place of hurt. And you know, my grandfather had to leave his mother behind and she died about two weeks after they left the country and that was painful for him. But he was, he was pretty good about sharing stories. He wasn't good about sharing his objects, I'll say that. But he was great about sharing stories. Um, and yeah, with all the series of, I did all these interviews in grad school with them and I asked them really specific questions and got them on you know, audio tape and they shared a lot of their experience. Um, I mean, it, I guess it depends on you know, how willing people are to talk about of that course. stuff. I mean, yeah, it, that's, that's how I feel too. I yeah. keep telling my wife, like, we need to get this recorded or some, and he gives small pieces out. Yeah. Because uh, there are some, like my, they're her family, they have rumors where they think that he was even involved in the revolution and they were kind of trying to track him down and that was one reason why he was like, I, I have to get out of here and yeah. you know what I mean? So uh, I just wondered if like that was, cause it's so hard to be like, this is so tough for you to share, but I, I wanna know the history. Like it's such a story, uh, such a great story to someone who you know, never experienced something like that, so. But yeah, I mean, I think, tr like, I was pretty upfront when I asked my grandfather and I told him I was recording the conversations and stuff. Um, and I think, you know, you ask them some questions and you kind of just let them go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think generally if they understand that you're really interested in it and for, you know, for what reason. I think it was nice for my grandfather. Like, he was, again, I think a bit of the archivist. He had, you know, he remembered everything. And I think, you know, when he passed away, he left me all the photo albums. And I think he enjoyed the fact that I was interested in this stuff and like documenting it. So. Yeah, that's great. I mean, obviously, what you did is very beautiful. So yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Regina? So, kind of to jump off of Stuart's question. Um, have you ever thought about how to archive your own digital items and where to leave them? Like, for example, you know, having a set of hard drives somewhere or, you know,
know, having a website up that will live on, or those type of things, or audio recordings for other people to find? I have not thought about <laughs> my digital afterlife. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm inter I mean, I'm interested in that stuff. I think it's really, I think it's really relevant. Um, I got to work on some great projects after this um, with the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And I took all of my dead electronics and uh, archived them and photographed them in the same way. And then I told a story about why I bought them. And, and then I looked at all of the old advertisements from when they first came out. And again, it's the same thing where it's like all that language is super, it's exactly the same as talking about an iPod or iPad as it is talking about this old typewriter. Um, so, I mean, I haven't really thought about that. I think, I mean, I've told my wife that, I mean, sure, put it all up. I don't care <laughs> um, if something happens to me. But, um, I, unlike Son and Zimmer, I do save my files. I totally save every version. <laughs> do not save over that stuff. Not on purpose. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I, I think part of starting this website with my grandfather's stuff was like, you know, archiving it online and having that stuff up there. And I liked that it's, it's there in the ether. I don't know. Maybe you could help me work out a plan. <laughs> so my question is, I guess, really connected to that. Um, you obviously have a, an extreme interest in history and, and archival documentation. Um, could you speak to some of the new, or if you have a current project, or some of the new things you're doing right now? Because that seemed like such a big, big part of your life, and obviously this stuff you just, just mentioned um, is. And so I, I'd be really interested in hearing about what you're what you're thinking about now or what you're working on? Yeah, um, so a lot of these little elements play into the work I do for other clients. Like, my work is very textural and abstract. Uh, and, you know, a lot of it comes from documentation. I'm usually either photographing or working from uh, artifacts. But honestly, I did this talk uh, because I'd really actually like to transition this, I mean, this is a two-year-old project, right? So some of you might be wondering why I'm talking about this. But I, there was something about this project that really resonated with me, and I want to get back to that. And so I've been thinking about just, you know, I'm working on more prints now for the fall. I am um, really starting to think about engaging with these historical objects and, you know, how do we preserve this history in a way that's like, that's contemporary. I'm, you know, I love vintage objects, but I'm not, I'm not going to live in a museum either. Like, I'm, they're not going to be all over my house. Um, I, I really like modern design. So, you know, how do we, how do we keep this history around us in a way that is relevant to the people that we are right now? And so I've actually been thinking about and working on uh, developing a product line that, you know, has these little patterns of everyday history with, you know, paper goods and things like that. But also, I'm interested in working on, you know, commissions as well. Like, I would be happy for somebody to send me five objects from their, you know, family member or whatever, and I get to just go crazy on those things. Because I really like, Again, while I love walking into like um, uh, a secondhand store or an antique shop and like seeing all this like old things, like I love that, but it feels a little bit disembodied to me. And I, what I really love are the stories behind it. So like hearing about the fact that like someone's grandfather carried around this fanny pack or like, you know, like, and it can be really weird stuff, right? It doesn't have to be this like, you know, super crazy object that was like passed down from like the First World War or something. Um, so I'm, it was really weird to develop this talk because I feel like I'm in a point of transition um, with my business and stuff. You know, it's going on five years with Winter Bureau. And this is really the stuff I want to get back to. And so that's why I talked about it. So that's hopefully what I have on the horizon. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. Um, there's prints and pencils of hers in, for sale in the back of the room if you guys are interested in checking them out in room person. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.